for uh, everything, everyone that's able to be here this morning. I pray that we would just have a, a great time of fellowship as your people and that we would give our all in our worship to you. Amen. Please stand as we sing our uh, sing. I know whom I have believed. Once the uh, I won't start <laughs> until I know uh, everyone can see what's on the screen. Please, trying to find it. Yeah. There we go. Welcome and here we go. There's it. Here we go. I know not why God's wondrous grace to me hath made. in love redeemed me for his own but I know who I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day I know not how his saving faith to me To him against that day. I know not how the Spirit moves, convincing men of sin, revealing Jesus through the Word, creating faith in him. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he is able to keep which I've committed unto him against that day. I know not when my Lord may come that night or noonday fair, nor if I walk the veil with him or meet him in the air. But I know whom I have believed and am persuaded that he to keep that which I've committed unto him against that day. Great singing. You can have a seat. Good morning. Oops, something new here. Sorry, whole new world here. Got to get out my glasses. All right. Several, hey, we're glad you're here today. Wherever you're here, we're glad you're here. So good to have you with us today as we're here to worship, explore, study, learn, hang out, whatever. Glad you're here doing it. All right, a few announcements. Uh, we're continuing to look for nursery workers, and also we can now always handle another uh, few workers in Children's Church. We're back to being able to offer Children's Church both services now, and because we got the two services, it works out good because if you're in children's church, you kind of miss church, miss the, the message, but you could always come to both, and then you spend one in here and one in there. works out, but that's up to you. But anyway, uh, if you're interested in that, please uh, see one of us. Um, talk to Beth, talk to me, talk to Jen Brosey, who's around here somewhere, um, or Charlene Churchill, who's also, they're probably in there setting up right now. Uh, coming up on October 7th, Jameson Turner. Now, most of you probably don't know Jameson. He grew up in this church, but that was a long time ago. Um, but his brother is sitting over there, Jake Wave. His, Jake's only claim to fame is Jameson's brother. That's not true. Jake's been a part of us a long time, too. But it's Jake's younger brother. Jonathan is oftentimes here, too. Um, and Joy is the mom. And Joy's been here longer than I have. And uh, Joy and Mark. So anyway, Jameson, um, he, he's, he's been fighting some cancer. And uh, they're going to have a work day at his house on October 7th from 9 a.m. to whenever they're done. And uh, there is lunch provided. If you are able and interested in helping, uh, please let Rick Simino know. And his number is in your bulletin. 
All right. If you're, by the way, if you're willing to help with nursery, Carol and Spencer's number is in the bulletin. Uh, Cody is off this week and next, so if you have a Cody question, it's now a Beth or Ira question, just so you know. Um, we're also having breakfast each week. If you want to help out with that, there's a sign-up sheet um, out in the lobby if you want to help with that. Also in the lobby is our fall community sign-up, and we'd like to get people coming to the community. So come, you know, there's different ones, different studies, different things you can do, and we'd love to have you be a part of that. Also, kind of like a community, but starting next Sunday at 9.30, so here, on, uh, between services at 9.30, Steve Rothert is doing a four-week study called The Fundamentals of Faith. So if you're kind of exploring, starting out, whatever, this will be something that you might be interested in. Also, uh, we have a bonfire coming up this Friday, the 6th, and that is starting at 6 p.m. And uh, it's just gonna, we're just going to hang out and have fire and there's food, including a community stew. So if you can, bring some vegetables, a can of vegetable of your choice to add to the stew. It's just kind of those, everybody just dumps something in, and then we have a great stew to share. Also, if you can bring a bag of candy to add to our supply for Trunk or Treat. Speaking of Trunk or Treat, that is coming up on the 29th, 2 to 4, Sunday afternoon, the 29th, 2 to 4, Trunk or Treat. If you would be willing to do a trunk, we would love to have you come do a trunk. Please bring lots of candy. We have, the last couple of years, we have uh, had so many kids that we've tended to run out of candy, and that's kind of sad for the later kids, if you like. So uh, here's a half a Tootsie Roll, because um, we have been seeing between three to 400 kids. So plan accordingly, all right? I think that's all the announcements, I think. I have a, thank, a card here from Trudy, and it's good to see her, and it says, I would like to thank everyone for all the prayers, texts, and cards I have received over the past few months. Please continue to pray for healing, Trudy, and it's great to have Trudy here today, and uh, please continue to pray for her. All right, I think I've hit everything, and uh, so now we're going to receive our offering and then sing some more. Please stand as we continue our time of worship.
are the days of Ezekiel, the dry bones becoming as flesh. And these are the days of your servant, David, rebuilding a temple of praise. And these are the days of the harvest, the fields are as white in the world. Shining like the sun at the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee, and now to Zion's hill, salvation comes. There's no God like Jehovah. 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 Behold, He comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun at the trumpet call. Lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee. He comes riding on the clouds, shining like the sun. At the trumpet call, lift your voice. It's a year of jubilee, and now to Zion's hill, salvation comes. And now to Zion's hill, salvation comes. Now to Zion's hill, salvation comes. to the hill of Calvary, my Savior went courageously, and there he bled and died for me, hallelujah for the cross. And on that day the world was changed, the What good I've done could never save my debt to pay for deeds to pay. But God, my Savior, made a way. Hallelujah for the cross. A slave to sin, my life was bound, but all my chains fell to the ground. When Jesus' blood came, This hope will guide me into death. Hallelujah for the cross. Hallelujah for the war he fought. Love has won. Death has lost. Hallelujah for the souls he bought. Hallelujah for the cross. So 
Children, come on down. <laughs> come on down, guys. Oh. All right. I've got a tough one today. All right. Tough questions today. Are you ready for it? 
I know, I said that last time. I, 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 I say that almost every week, really. All right, here's the, here's the question. What is a surprise? A surprise is a surprise. Yes, but what is a surprise? All right. Being tortured, is that would be a surprise. Not quite what I was thinking, but what's a surprise? What's a surprise? What do you think? Yeah, easy, easy. <laughs> so what, what would you say is a surprise? A surprise is like you jump out and say surprise. Or like you say so you surprise. jump out and go, surprise! So you take someone somewhere. Sounds like kidnapping. <laughs> that, oh, not kidnapping. You mean you, you mean you mean a good way? Is a surprise? Would would if I gave you a present, would that be a surprise? All right. Can so is so if I suddenly like I'm sitting here, I'm sitting here. Boom! Was that a surprise? No. no? <laughs> Some of you jumped though. So if you jumped, that means it was a surprise. Is a surprise? always good no. oh a surprise might be bad huh you might be surprised by something like you ever stub your toe yes. right why'd you stub your toe because you didn't see it coming you're like oh ow ow and so that's a surprise but you don't like it so but a lot of surprises are fun like a surprise party or a surprise well if you don't like a surprise party then it wouldn't be a good thing would it well you know here's a secret most kids like surprises more than grown-ups. As grown-ups get bigger, they tend to not like surprises. And you know who surprises grown-ups the most? Kids. Because you guys will just do stuff and the grown-ups are like, why'd you do that? It's a surprise. And rarely are the parents like, now you can surprise your parents in ways they might like. Like, look, I cleaned the entire house. They're like, wow. What a surprise. But usually it's a surprise like who left muddy footprints all over the floor. That's a surprise. And they're like, not a fan. Well, you know what? Sometimes, okay, new question. Does God know everything? Yes. <gasps> so God can't be surprised, can he? No, God can't be surprised because he knows everything. But remember what I said about grown-ups? Do grown-ups like surprises? Yes. Not generally. Sometimes they do, but not generally. But God sometimes surprises grown-ups. Huh? Because God sometimes does things that we don't expect, and grown-ups don't like that. So you know what? While you guys are at Children's Church today, I'm going to talk to the grown-ups about that. We're going to have to have a chat about surprises. Because, so I hope, because you know what? You guys are kids now, but you know what's going to happen to you? You're going to grow up. Well, I hope you're right. I don't want you to. But the kids that used to come up here, the kids that used to come up here, you know what they did? They grew up. One of the little girls used to come up here, she just got married. That's crazy. She grew up. And when you grow up, you know what you're going to be? You're going to be a grown-up. And what, how do grown-ups feel about surprises? They don't like them as much as kids. So I hope as you grow up that you don't, don't lose liking certain surprises. And remember, even if God surprises you, God's surprises are always good, even if you don't like it. And that's what I have to talk about with the grown-ups today. I don't want to pay bills either, so can I be a kid again? So, yeah. So, so we'll sing together, I don't want to grow up, I'm a toy. Well, that, they kind of went out of business. So, all right, you guys can go to Children's Church. You guys have been awesome. Thank you. You're going to hang out here? All right, you get to hear what the grown-ups hear then. I am not, but I wish I was. Jeff is going to come and be our reader today. Those kids are awesome. I don't want to grow up. Amen. Do you want to help me pray first? Sure, sure. Do you want to say something before you do? Hmm? Do you want to say something before you do, or do you just want me to pray? Just pray. All right. We're going we're gonna to have a quick word of prayer. Jeff has a cousin who's pass who is uh, dying. Um, and so it's been really hard. She's, uh, she's older. She has kidney failure. Uh, no, it's uh, kidneys. It's kidney and failure. liver. 
Yeah. So we're going to say a quick word of prayer for Jeff and his family and for his cousin who's passing away, and they're just going to read our scripture for today. Let's pray. Good morning, Father. Lord, we thank you that sometimes we have things happen to us and things come that we don't like. We just talked about it with the kids. And Lord, uh, Jeff and his family are facing that today with his cousin. And just be with her and be with the whole family uh, during this time. Let them hold on to you and draw near to you. Help Jeff to do that as well. Thank you that he is part of our family here. And uh, so we just continue to pray for your uh, just grace and mercy over them. And uh, we just thank you that you are there and that you see all things and that you're with us. And we just pray these things in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. Um, for those of you on the prayer chain, I just want to say thank you. Um, I know uh, death can be difficult sometimes, and I'm struggling to get through this. So thank you all for your prayers this week. Okay, we are going to read James chapter 4, verse 13 and 14. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we shall go to such and such a town, spend a year there, trade, and come off with a profit. You have no idea what kind of life will be yours tomorrow. You are a vapor that appears briefly and vanishes. Thank you, Jeff. Short and sweet today. We are in part four of time of, time of my life. Living life, we've been looking at uh, what life in Christ means and what it means to live the Christian life. We'll talk about that more in a minute. Uh, reminder, we got the question box out there. Please do not forget, if you have questions either that have come up through this series, stuff that from we've talked about has raised questions for you, or just questions in general about anything to do with the Bible or God or the whole thing. Um, any of those good? We've got some good ones in there already. Love to have some more. So feel free to submit those in because Sunday after next we'll be answering them for Sabbath Sunday. All right, our question this morning for discussion is how do or did, because some of you are at that stage, and others of you are young, how do or did you picture retirement? And then if you're retired, how's it look now? All right, Marissa's going to start us off here. She's got thoughts on this. I'm assuming you're not retired yet, no. but <laughs> she's on the young side. Thank you. <laughs> so I picture myself on a very big farm with lots of horses and cattle and maybe some miniature cows as well. Miniature cows. They're the cutest ever. <laughs> <laughs> All right, so... Farming doesn't sound like a quiet retirement, but she's on a farm. All right, Linda, also too young to retire. Oh, yeah, right. <laughs> Not exactly. I am retired, and it's the best job I've ever had. It doesn't pay well, but the benefits are wonderful. <laughs> I'm pretty much doing what I hope to be doing um, and serve the Lord in whatever ways he comes up with, and that constantly surprises me. <laughs> I didn't include the health problems I'm having. I kind of didn't expect that, but you know, it's all part of the game. So, <laughs> <laughs> so we'll, we'll, we'll put one, one in favor, just that and then. <laughs> so I am retired and how did I picture being retired was living on a beach <laughs> and waking up every day and looking at the waves. But that's not reality, so I am tired, and it looks like right now I am enjoying my life with my children and my grandchildren, mm. and love them dearly. Mm. We'll, we'll spread some sand on your driveway and call it a beach. <laughs> yeah. We'll see you in the Dominican. We'll get a week of that. <laughs> no. Well, I've been retired now almost 20 years. Well, the first 15 weren't too bad. You know, did what I wanted to, did, you know. But the last five... Uh, God has said, oh, well, it's about time you had a few conflicts, you know, so you might as well just enjoy it if you can. But, you know, God is always gracious. And there's a verse that says, in Psalm 138, 8, says, Thou will perfect that which concerneth me. Thy mercy, O Lord, endures forever. Forsake not the work of thine own hands. So every day I say, Lord, remember you made me. Now, come on, correct me, you know. <laughs> but it seems to correct me mentally. 
and the things I do instead of my body. But oh well, <laughs> you have to you have to do with both. Right, right. And I'm waiting for him to correct you. Oh yes. <laughs> Aren't we all? Aren't we all? My goodness, yes. <laughs> How did I pitch a retirement? Uh, life slowing down. No, it didn't. It, it didn't. <laughs> um, how does it look now? Different, um, but just as busy, sometimes busier. But God has allowed me to um, bless others with what I'm able to do in retirement. Mm, mm. Anyone else want to talk either what they're looking for or what they found, Jeff? Well, uh, I'm semi-retired. I'm on disability, but um, I thought I was going to be able to play golf full-time. <laughs> Unfortunately, I injured my back. Um, so now I'm just trying to um, find my way of being physical other ways. Mm, mm. So not a lot of golf now. Not a lot no, of golf. Not a lot of golf. <laughs> Anyone else? Good discussion this morning. I figured we change the pace a little bit, make it easier. All right, well, we'll go from there. My strategy to retire is one of these days I'll die. Up until then, I've got stuff to do. All right, let's review where we've been looking at this series. As I mentioned, we've been looking at what, is, what does it mean, life in Christ? And if you, like me, if you grew up kind of church adjacent or around church stuff, then salvation was oftentimes presented as kind of a retirement plan. That oftentimes we were asked, I remember growing up, and the question was, are you, when you die, will you go to heaven? When you die, are you ready to face the Lord? When you, so it was always kind of based on what happens later. And yeah, there was plenty of what happens now, and now, okay, now you got to you know, follow rules and you know, be a good person, all that. But eternal life was really about later. It was about the judgment and about going to heaven someday and not going to hell and that stuff. And so it was always kind of presented as a retirement plan. And what we've been talking about is that that's not actually a biblical picture, that it talks about life and death starting now. And we looked at when Adam and Eve were in the garden, and they were warned about eating the tree of the knowledge of good and bad, and God told them, the day you eat that, you will die. And we know that they ate it, and they didn't drop dead. They, their lungs kept working. Their heart kept working. We're like, well, they, he said they were going to die. They didn't die. Well, except they did because it was, God wasn't talking about, Jesus wasn't talking about physical life primarily. He was talking about life in general and that life is separation. Life is, is death is, I'm sorry, death is separation. And when they ate the fruit, they were immediately separated from God and from each other. We see them hiding from God. We see them hiding their bodies from each other and blaming each other and turning on each other. So there's a separation now, and they are starting to experience pain in the relationships that they have, separation in the relationships. That's death. And hell is the ultimate separation. But eternal life and eternal death are things that we experience now. So when we talk about coming into life in Jesus or getting saved, whatever the terminology you want to use, we're talking about, does that change our life now? Are we entering into a different kind of life? And we've been studying that. And we talked about the fact that in turning from a life that's based on us into a life that's based on God, that that requires us dying to self, and dying is hard. We do not like to die. We resist dying. We resist turning away from ourselves. So it's, it's really hard to turn to this new life. We struggle with it. We struggle with turning away from ourselves. So then we talk about, well, aren't we just supposed to follow the rules? And last week we talked about the law and the rules. And that the law is not how we are supposed to live. And that messes with us because a lot of us, we were raised to believe you're supposed to, how you're supposed to live. These are the rules. Follow the rules. These are the rules for life. But we saw last week that the law is to remind you to die. Because you can't live under the law. And even when you try, say, I'm going to try to be a good person, I'm going to try to follow the law, you can succeed to a point, but you will never fully succeed. You will always break the law, you will always fail, because the law is there to show you that you can't do it, and that life is not going to be achieved through doing everything right and following the rules. Now, the law is not bad. And we talked about the fact, so should you follow the law? Well, yeah, it's still good. Not killing people, 
definitely a plus. All right, so you can put that in your notes. Thou shalt not kill. Heard that somewhere. It's important. Yes. But following those rules are not your way of life. Your way, the rules are there to remind you that life is found in God because you are never going to follow the rules perfectly. You're never going to be good enough. And God does not ask you to be. He was good for you. That's the point of Jesus. So that's what we talked about before. So now let's talk about life now and then. And that brings us to the passage that Jeff read to us and beyond. So if you haven't turned there yet, look at James chapter 4. And looking at, we're going to look verses 13 through 16. Um, He read verses uh, 13 and 14 is what we gave out there. But let's keep going. Come now, you who say, today or tomorrow we will go to such and such a city and spend a year there and engage in business and make a profit. Yet you do not know what your life will be like tomorrow. You are just a vapor that appears for a little while and then vanishes away. Instead, you ought to say, if the Lord wills, we will live and also do this or that. But as it is, you boast in your arrogance. All such boasting is evil. All right, so it starts with this, and some of us have heard this before, but let's just kind of unpack it. It says that do not pretend that your mortal life is certain. Do not pretend that your mortal life is certain. He says, you say, oh, next week we're going to do this. Next year we're going to do this. Tomorrow I'm going to do this. He says, but you don't know. You don't know what's going to happen tomorrow. You don't know what's going to happen. So don't boast. Don't pretend that you do. Don't pretend that you do. Now, it doesn't say that making plans is wrong. It says, but, but understand, and we, we all know that, but we struggle with that. We'll talk about that more in a minute after we've unpacked all this. But he says, do not ignore the uncertainty of your life, your mortal life, because you don't know what's going to happen any given day. Then he keeps going. Let's keep looking. So verse 17 says, therefore, to the one who knows the right thing to do and does not do it, to him it's sin. In other words, uh, don't do things you know better. It's pretty simple. Moving on, chapter 5, verse 1 through 6. Come now, you rich, and weep, and howl for your miseries which are coming upon you. Your riches have rotted, and your garments have become moth-eaten. Your gold and your silver have rusted, and their rust will be a witness against you, and will consume your flesh like fire. It is in the last days that you have stored up your treasure. Behold, the pay of the laborers who mowed your fields, and which has been withheld by you, cries out against you, and the outcry of those who did the harvesting has reached the ears of the Lord of Sabaoth. You have lived luxuriously on the earth and led a life of wanton pleasure. You have fattened your hearts in a day of slaughter. You have condemned and put to death the the righteous man. He does not resist you. So the second part, boy, that sounds kind of awful, right? It's talking about now the uncertainty of material life. And notice James borrows... Uh, something that Jesus said. Jesus said, do not store up for yourself treasures on earth where moth and rust corrupt. And here he brings that up here. He says, your riches have rotted, your garments have become moth-eaten, your gold and your silver have rusted. So he, he's basically kind of grabbing that picture from Jesus of moth and rust corrupting your treasure. So first he said, your time, your mortal life, your plans don't always go as expected. Now he's saying, and neither does your treasure. But he goes further because he's not just talking about the fact that your treasure is temporary. He's also talking about that the way you usually can get the most treasure is by living selfishly. The way you get the most treasure is by living selfishly. Here he says specifically, you rip off the people who work for you. He says, you withheld money from the workers, and that's how you got rich. You didn't pay. Now, I think we can all take comfort in the fact that in a a capitalistic system, this doesn't happen. That we never have to worry about the people who are running things keeping the money and the worker not getting a fair share. That's why we don't have to worry about strikes and things like that, because it doesn't happen. But if it did, that'd be terrible, right? That's what he's saying here. He says, if you made money off of other people, not by legitimate business, but by cheating, by withholding, by not rewarding those who did the work. He said, you're, you're just making money that you're not going to get to keep. So he's not, he's not condemning free enterprise. He's not condemning good business. He's condemning riches at the expense of others. 
and living selfishly, hoarded treasure. He says, why? Because you're not going to keep it anyway. And you store up all this extra money, and then it's just going to rot and rust, and you're going to lose it. And this is echoing Jesus. And so then, what's the solution? He says in verse 7 and 8, Therefore, and this therefore goes both with the don't boast about tomorrow and the riches thing. Therefore, be patient, brethren, until the coming of the Lord. The farmer waits for the precious produce of the soil, being patient about it until it gets the early and late rains. You too, be patient, strengthen your hearts, for the coming of the Lord is near. So he says, in other words, when it comes to both your time and your treasure, be patient with God's provision. God is going to take care of these elements of your life. You don't have to. And then he's basically all comes back to chapter 4, verse 14. Why? Because you are a vapor. He says, you're a mist. You come up and then you blow away. I put it this way, this is not the life to make the most of. And that is something that you hear people say, oh, I, you know, this is my life and I need to make the most of it. There are even preachers who say, listen, you need to, you know, live your best life now. You need to make the most of your life now. And James is saying, this is not the life to make the most of. Why? Because it is uncertain and will rot. Your treasure and your time, you do not have as much control over as you think. This is not the life to make most of. So as we've been considering these two different lives that we can live now, the question is which life are we living and why would we choose a life in Jesus versus a life of ourselves? Because a lot of people find life here for ourselves pretty good. So in application, let's ask this question. Your life now. Is your life now the kingdom and Jesus? Or is it self-centered now only? Where is your head and your heart focused? Where is your head and your heart focused? Because what is easy to do and what is tempting to do is to live like this is it. And so I make decisions based on right now. And how do I feel today? And how do I feel this week? And what are my immediate needs? And that's why it's fun to ask about um, retirement. Because, like, well, I just read a statistic that how many people uh, my age and younger have nothing. And it's like, they're not, why do you have nothing? Well, because I'm not saving. Because if I save, what I do is I say, I'm not going to use my resources now. I'm going to use them later. And the more I don't use now, which means going without the more I will have later, but it means I have to sacrifice. I have to say no to myself today. I don't like to say no to myself today. I have the money now. I should be able to spend it now. Well, I can do that, but then when I'm not working anymore, I don't have any money. This idea of, but why? Because I, I'm, I'm making decisions based on now. Well, what if this life, even when I turn 70 or 80 or 90, if the Lord keeps me around that long, what if that's not it? And I live like it is. Just like it's unwise for a 20-something not to think about the fact that eventually they might be 60, it's not wise for anyone to think about the fact that this isn't your whole life. And that's what he's saying. Are you living for now only, based on yourself? Don't live life like this is it. Now, our thing is, we tend to create artificial certainty and security. We like to feel safe and secure. So we create that picture. And the problem is, and what he's saying here, is that is not reality. But we, we think we have control. I'll give you a couple examples. because So here's one of my favorite ones from my own life. Because there is no better parent than a young person about to have children. When you haven't had any yet, oh, you, you, are, you have wisdom beyond your years. You know how this is going to go. You're such a good parent before you've had any kids. So we were pregnant with our first child. We didn't know, boy or girl. I'm 33, so I'm not even one of those young youngsters who's only 22. I'm 30. I'm old already. 
And I was like, you know what I'm going to do? Because I'd read, you know, how the, you know, in the womb they can still hear, sound is still going in there, and then in the amniotic, whatever, the sound resonates. And I've got a nice low voice, so low, you know, low sound travels better through, through water. So I'm going to sing to the baby a certain song, one song. This is the song I sing to the baby. And the baby will associate the song with comfort and peace. I come to the garden alone while the dew is still on the road and he walks with me and he talks with me. So I sang to my wife's tummy. Because then when the baby was born and the baby was fussy, I would hold the baby and I would sing that song and the baby would go, oh, I know this song, and comfort. <laughs> and would just stop fussing. And I had this beautiful picture of how this is going to work. And I sang for months to this child, and then we had the child, and I did it. Guesses on how well it worked. I'll give you multiple choice. Not at all. You've got to be kidding me, and yeah, right. Pick your... Not once did I pick up this crying child. I come to the... And the kid's like, what are you doing? Never did she... You know, it was Esther. She never went, oh, I remember this. Oh, I'll stop crying now. Nope. Nope. Never. Ever. But I... I I knew what the future was going to be, and I knew how to plan for it. Didn't work out that way. But we tend to create this artificial certainty. And so that's, that's artificial certainty, where I know what's going to happen. Here's artificial security. So when the kids were younger, uh, this is, mm, I've gotten better. Good? No. Better? Sure. Um, but when the kids were younger, Sarah would sometimes take them and go down to visit Mormor and Grampy two hours away uh, down in southern Maine. And uh, I would be staying here to work or whatever. And uh, I was a wreck. I mean, the first time she ever left with, she just had Esther back then. Like, my mother-in-law called to see if she'd left yet, and I was crying. Because I'm a wreck. Because they're gone. And I, I was never quite that much of a wreck ever again. But I would be worried. Call when you get there. Call when you get there. Make sure you call me when you get there. Make sure you get there safe. Why? Well, because it's two hours away, and all I can think of is they're going to die. It's going to be a car accident. I'm, just, I'm a wreck the whole time. I'm just sure something bad's going to happen because it's two hours and they're going to ride on the interstate and Route 4. And Route 4, I mean, you're taking your life in your hands. We all know Route 4 is a terrible place to drive. So I'm scared. Now, sometimes we would all go to Mormor and Grampy's and I would drive. Was I a wreck then? Of course not. I'm driving. I will keep them safe. I'm a good driver. I'm in control. I didn't have any anxiety at all when I was driving. Now, say so you don't trust your wife's driving? Of course not. Why? Well, it's because she's not a good driver? No, if you want to compare her driving and mine, I'm not sure I win that one. She's probably a much safer driver than me, probably. Well, then why do I feel safer when I'm driving? Because I'm in control. And my sense of control is it artificial? Yeah, it's not real. They are not safer with me behind the wheel than when I'm home and they're driving. But I feel different. Why? Because it's this illusion of control. And we do that with our lives. We say, as long as I can kind of get my ducks in order and get my, you know, I get things set and then I feel safe and secure. I kind of know what's going to happen and I've got my life figured out. And that works great until... Something happens that robs you of that illusion, and then we don't do well. And that's why I said to the kids, adults don't like surprises. Why? Because most surprises break your illusion that you know what you're doing and that you've got this figured out. And, and being Christian doesn't make that go away because oftentimes we take those plans and then we kind of baptize them and say, well, I made these plans and God's with me, so now I know. And God's like, you still don't know. I mean, James is talking to Christians here. He's not talking just to the general public here. The illusion of control. Now, we've got to really say here, this is not saying that plans and saving and resources are bad. They're not wrong. He doesn't say when he says, you who say, Today or tomorrow, we're going to go to thus and such a city and live for you and make a profit. He doesn't say the plan is bad. He said boasting as if you know what's going to happen is. He doesn't say don't plan. He says don't boast. Sometimes we read this as, well, you know, you're not supposed to make plans. No, he didn't say that. 
But don't make plans as if you don't convince yourself of that which you don't know. Your life is uncertain. Don't lie to yourself about the certainty of your mortal life or the permanency of your treasure. They cannot be what your life rests on. And that's the trick. Because should we make plans? Yeah, we have to. Should we prepare for the future? That is wisdom. Should we then have confidence that we can control that? No, because sometimes it doesn't go according to plan. And that's why he says, instead you should say, as the Lord wills. He is not saying just always throw in a disclaimer, and as long as you say the words, that's okay. There are people who do that. They'll just say, as the Lord wills, or Lord willing. Now, I try to do that a lot. I'll, I will say, like, if I'm traveling or whatever, and I'm talking to Sarah, and she's like, when do you expect to be home? I'll say, well, I'll be home tonight at nine, or I'll be home tomorrow. Lord willing. And the reason I say Lord willing is not because I'm just trying to give myself an out, or not in a superstitious way of i got to throw that in there because if I don't throw that in there, God's going to throw a monkey wrench into it because God is not playing games with me. The reason I throw in Lord willing is I am talking to me to remind myself that every time I make a plan, I need to remember that I don't know. So my plan is based on whether that's what God ends up doing or not. But am I wrong to plan? No. Am I wrong to plan as if I am in control? Yes. The minute I pretend that my life is all here and now and under my control, I am now al- I'm centering my life on me and my abilities. And my abilities are far weaker than I want to believe. I want to believe as long as I'm behind the wheel, we can never have an accident. But if my wife's behind the wheel, anything goes. That's not reality. I want to believe as long as I've got the kids with me, I can protect and control the kids. That is not reality. I want to believe as long as I do the right thing, nothing bad will ever happen. That is not reality. And so I say, well, Lord, this is my plan. Your will be done. Because I don't know your plan. That's why we call it trust. Because he doesn't just say, all right, here's my entire plan. Because if he did that, we'd go, great, thanks. I'll talk to you when we're done. And that wouldn't be trust. That would just be spiritual pride. And that's why he says in verses 13 through 16 in chapter 4, he said, don't assume the certainty of life. You're a vapor. You you don't know what tomorrow's going to be. And so when tomorrow everything goes sideways, we're like, whoa, I didn't see that coming. God's like, exactly. So plan, but know that I'm in control. And then in chapter 5, verses 1 through 6, he says, don't hoard your temporary treasure. You can't hold on to it. Even when you think you've got a lot, that's not how your life's going to consist, which is why elsewhere it says life, even when one has an abundance, life does not consist of riches. And that's hard for us because we long for the sense of safety and security. We long for a sense of certainty. Tell me how it's going to go. Tell me how it's going to go. And God says, trust me. And we struggle with that. We try to, even the verses where he says, trust me, we try to turn into promises of certainty. For we know, try this one out. You know this verse. For we know that all things work together for the good of those who, for those who love God, for those who are this is the part we breeze over, are called according to His purpose. In other words, I know that whatever happens in my life, even if it's against my plans, even if it hurts, even if it's awful, I know that if I trust His plan, everything in the end will be okay, but in the end may not include my present comfort. Just like Planning for retirement does not include oftentimes my present financial comfort because, no, I can't go buy what I want to buy now because I'm not living for now. And that means there are things that I have to die to self now because all things will work together if I trust His purposes. But His purposes will look different than my plans. And that's hard 
And that's why it's hard to die to that because I'll say, but Lord, this is how I want my life to go. And that's why adults hate surprises because when God says, oh, by the way, you have this disease. By the way, here's what happened to your nest egg. By the way, you're going to lose your job. By the way, there was an accident. We say, Lord, that wasn't my plan. I know. But I know what I'm doing. Do you trust me? And my answer usually is, no. No, I should. No, I don't. So the question is, we all have time, we all have talents, we all have treasure. We don't have them in equal measure. Some people get more time than others. Some people get decades and decades, and some people don't. Some people have a lot of treasure, some people have none, or very little earthly treasure. Whatever you have, do you see it as for you for now? Or is it his? Are these for you to grasp, for you to hold on to, for you to try to be the Lord of? Or do you say, no, Lord willing, Lord willing, what you have given me is yours. My life is yours. That's going to be tricky. That's what we call dying to self. Are you living for Him? Or are you living for you? Let's pray. Father, I thank you that as we struggle with this, that you are faithful. Lord, it is hard for us to trust you. We would rather trust our sense of control. We want to feel secure. We want to take care of ourselves first. Lord, you have told us to be wise, to be good with our resources, to save, to plan. You've told us to conduct ourselves with wisdom and not to be foolish. But Lord, that call for us to save and to think about the future and to plan is never apart from you and your will. So, Lord, as we struggle with dying to self as opposed to living for ourselves, Lord, help us to not live selfishly. Help us to not think, even as we may be very generous and kind people, even as we may be very good people, help us not to still put ourselves in the center. Thank you that you, with all riches and time, gave up your life for us as a model now of what we must do so that we can receive this better life that you've given us, that we can live each day without the fear, without the need for control, without the need for grasping for riches. We thank you, in Jesus' name, amen. Before we sing, if you haven't watched Schindler's List, I encourage you to watch it sometime, but it's a, it's a rugged movie. It's about the Holocaust. It's not a feel-good movie. But there's a scene at the end that's really always has stuck with me. I've, envisioned, I've, I've brought it up before, where Schindler, who's done, I mean, the whole movie is named after the guy. He's the hero of the movie. He bankrupted his company to save the lives of his Jewish employees. And yet at the end, so you say, he's a good man. He's a man who lived for others. That's the whole point of the movie, right? Except at the end of the movie, as the, Reich has, the Third Reich has collapsed, the camps have been liberated, and he's got to flee because he's a member of the Nazi party. So he's got to flee. And his workers all sign a thing to say, hey, if you catch this guy, he's a good guy. Don't, don't. He's not a bad Nazi. He's a good guy. But in that moment, as he's surrounded by all these people he saved, and they're all like, thank you, you've been wonderful, you're awesome, he does not feel that way. He's guilt-ridden because he looks at his nice car and his nice coat and his nice rings and he goes, why did I keep these? And I remember one of the scenes that hits me the most. He pulls off one of his rings. It's this nice. He goes, how many lives was this worth? And that's the danger for us of being generous and yet still self-centered. Because oftentimes I think we, it's easy for us to say, well, I'm, I'm a very generous person. Right, but if your life is still centered around you, you're going to cost lives. And that's the point of Schindler. He said, I cost lives. Why? Because I kept my car. Because even though I was generous to a fault, I did not die to self. We're going to close with this song.
And I forgot until Joy started singing it in first service. This is the tune of Auld all, all, all Lang Syne. We sing this at the end of a year. We sing this when we're thinking about a new life and a new beginning and the end of an old one. So this is a great song. I'm so glad that Joy and Allie chose this. Please stand and let's sing this together and think about the words of, is your life about you or about Jesus? Should nothing of our efforts stand, no legacy survive. Unless the Lord does raise the house in vain, its builders strive to you who boast tomorrow's gain. Tell me what is your life amidst that van? is at dawn all glory be to Christ all glory be to Christ our King all glory be to Christ his rule and reign will ever sing all glory That's a tough one. Father, as we go from here, Lord, help us this week. As we go out, we're going to make plans. We got things we got to do. We got decisions we got to make. 
We need to be wise. We need to be good stewards. But Lord, help us through, as we look at our time, as we look at our treasure, as we look at our plans, may we see them in light of your life, not ours, your work, not ours, your eternity, not our temporariness. And Lord, we just pray we will live the kingdom now. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen.